I'm not an authority on behavioral science. My interest in the subject of serial offenders propelled me to create this video about serial killer typology. Typologies discussed in the books Mindhunter and Whoever Fights Monsters, two books that heavily influenced the Netflix series. To paraphrase John Douglas, the author of Mindhunter, behavioral science is exactly that, BS. He considers the work more of an art than a science, an art that stems from his ability to empathize with the victim and victimizer. She looks pretty tasty in that outfit. Doesn't she? Sure. Come on. You guys don't think so? <laughs> Definitely looks older than 12. See, that's what I thought. Okay. Thank you. So it's not just me. It should be noted that not only is the information I'm about to present to you a little dated, but any stratification I list is more of an abstract system of spectrums than concrete boxes for folks to fall into. But let's go monster hunting nevertheless, starting with social process theory. The premise that we all possess criminal potential, but our capacity for criminality depends on our socialization in our youth. Unfortunately, many killers experience neglect in their youth. Many also experience abuse at the hands of domineering parental figures. Well, a, a boy's best friend is his mother. They may be raised in an environment where sexual experimentation is punished as delinquency, say in the case of Jerry Brudos, who seemed from an early age to enjoy wearing women's shoes, but when his mother found out, she punished him for it. My mom burned the shoes. The stilettos? Dragged me into the backyard, poured kerosene all over them, lit them up. That must have been memorable. Formative events involving neglect or trauma can fuse the sex drive with the death drive. Destruction can cause arousal. If love, empathy, trust, and the basic morals of our social contract aren't imprinted at a young age, it may be impossible for certain people to learn them late in life. This inadequate socialization may result in what's called the McDonald Triad. Bedwetting, fire setting, and cruelty to animals all of which are early markers that a child might grow up to be a future offender, or have conduct disorder of the callous and unemotional subtype. Are they afraid that you might hurt them? Yep. Would you, Beth? Mm-hmm. When would you do it? Nighttime. Okay. Why would you do nighttime? Because I don't like them seeing me do it. But they can tell me do it. It's not necessary that someone do all three to be considered a future offender. In fact, many serial killers like child murderer John Wayne Gacy experienced none of these things while he grew up. Let's talk contemporary trait theory, which acknowledges that criminality is not just the product of a singular inherent trait, rather criminality emerges from the interaction between biological and physiological traits and environmental factors. The biological perspective deals with physiological compositions and imbalances, from small and seemingly innocuous traits like hypoglycemia inducing antisocial or violent behavior. Fascinating. You think so? Hypoglycemia. Is he lying or denying? My vote's with lying. To observed biochemical imbalances within the brain like minimal brain dysfunction, which may result in episodic periods of explosive rage. The biological perspective is also not limited to things like tumors pressing against the frontal lobe of the brain, something that likely caused Charles Whitman to climb the 28th floor of the observation deck of the Texas clock tower and fire upon 11 people, one of which was an unborn child. The physiological side focuses on behavior, personality disorders, and mental illness. Impaired social function brought on by things like schizophrenia and Asperger's syndrome may result in criminal behavior because the individual does not know how to properly interact with his or her social environment. But he wasn't trying to hurt anyone, he was trying to help. That's what he was doing, putting Daniel on that cross. I see that now. Take Richard Chase. 
the Vampire of Sacramento, a paranoid schizophrenic who harvested the blood of slain women and children. He defended his actions later to Rustler as a natural response to a Nazi plot to turn his blood into powder. BTK. He's a new animal. Lots of interesting contradictions. You mind? Regardless of how a serial killer comes to offend, their actions can be examined and classifications can be made of their character. Were they organized or disorganized? Were they non-social or asocial? Did they do it for pleasure or to experience power? There are of course mixes of these typologies, but the most popular are organized and non-social types like Ed Kemper or BTK. Killers that plan, killers that can carry on in society relatively unnoticed, camouflaged, or find pleasure in hunting their victim as a hunter might big game. So there's no pleasure, Ed? Sure there is. I just wanted the exaltation over the party. In other words, winning over death. They were dead and I was alive. That was the pleasure. I was the hunter, they were my victims. Can I help you with that? Ones like Ted Bundy may get a kick from trapping their victims through superior powers of persuasion. The disorganized asocial types are killers like Ed Gein, the basis for the film Psycho. They're rarely ones for persuasion for fear of humiliation. They orchestrate their attacks in a blitz fashion to avoid being overpowered. And because the majority of this type are ineffectual losers in life, they derive power from orchestrating another person's death. Another way to classify serial offenders is through their motive in what's known as the Holmes typology, which dictates that serial killers are either infatuated with the process or product of their kill. For instance, someone like BTK dwelled on the process of each of his murders. He fantasized about how he wished to bind, torture, and kill his victims. While someone like Ed Gein, on the other hand, though he fantasized about murders too, was far more concerned with the product, the body and what sort of home furnishings he could craft from it. Product and process split even further into subsets. Product splits into the two subsets of visionary, killers that suffer from hallucinations which order them to kill, and missionary, killers that find a mission and purpose in cleaning the streets of a particular type of victim. While process killers split into power killers, those that wish to play god, and hedonist killers which split into three further subsets, those being lust killers that derive sexual pleasure through torture and mutilation of their victims, thrill killers that find excitement through inducing pain and terror in their victims, and gain killers that have some comfort, financially or otherwise, to gain from their victims. Often these killers are women, more commonly known as black widows. Of course, like anything, the more you read about these subsets, the more they conflate with each other and confuse the classifications altogether. I was going to give a real-world example of each of these subsets, but it'd likely end in embarrassment. What in the hell am I doing telling you that? Am I looking, am I, am I a masochist? Am I looking to be tormented further? Instead, for part two of this video, I'd like to take the typologies we've discussed so far and attempt to classify two of the most infamous serial offenders in pop culture history, Hannibal Lecter and the Joker. 